Uh, we're talking about uh, taking uh, our lives, stepping up to the next level as men. And uh, this is our third session together. And in our first session, we talked about simply the making of a man and that God created us to reign, uh, specifically the words used in Genesis, to have dominion, we are to subdue. And so Satan strategizes to keep us from that calling that God has put up on us to keep us down so that we never become what or who God created us to be. So you need to understand, if you've not caught this out of the first two sessions, I want you to catch it. There's a warfare on for your life. And it's not just about your spiritual uh, future being heaven or hell. There is a battle for that. That's the ultimate battle. Satan wants nobody to be saved. But there's also a battle to keep you from becoming a strong man of God. Do we understand that? And, and that's to keep you not just from being a man of God. We use that term lots of times just in the spiritual sense. But it means that, uh, you know, I'm going to be a man of God to my family. I'm going to be strong in my family. I'm going to be a strong father to my children. I'm going to be a strong husband to my wife. I'm going to be uh, strong in whatever career I'm in. If I'm a businessman, I'm going to be strong in leading my business. Uh, I'm going to be strong in my community. I'm going to be strong in finances. I'm going to be strong in health. The list just goes on and on. How many of you know God wants us to be strong men of God? Amen. Praise the Lord. So uh, the reason we launched these sessions was uh, to take up, step up to the next level. And I hope over these first two sessions you've been challenged. And uh, uh, last week we talked about stretching yourself. You know, uh, when the Lord called uh, men to do anything in Scripture, He always uh, would call them to do something. In most cases, they didn't feel like they were qualified to do. You will not find, I don't know if you can find a good case of anybody who just jumped up and said, Lord, you have chosen the right man. I am the man for the job. No, most of the time when the Lord would call somebody to do anything, uh, there would be a sense of, well, Lord, I can't do that. Lord, who am I to do that? And even with the supernatural power of God working on their behalf and them having God's promise of His provision, they still struggled a lot of times to step out and be who God called them to be. Well, that's the warfare that's still going on today, I believe, with every human being, but especially with men. Satan does not want you to be a strong man, period. He wants you to be weak. He wants you to be inferior. Uh, and if that's the case, then you suffer for it. Your family suffers for it. Your marriage will suffer. Everything you're connected to will suffer because of it. So we can be strong men, but it requires us stretching ourselves. And last week we talked about that growth doesn't occur in our comfort zones. Real growth occurs when we do something to challenge ourselves. And I put a note there in the notes uh, discussion, what did you do to stretch yourself this week? Did you do anything? Did anybody do anything specifically this week to stretch yourself other than about five minutes ago when I had you step out and greet somebody? <laughs> That's, all <I> did. <laughs> That's all you've done. All right. Well, grace will give you another week, all right? But find some way, if you want to rise to a new level You've got, to, you've got to find some things to challenge you. And uh, it'll be different with everybody because uh, everybody doesn't have the same battles or the same mindsets. Uh, what I might struggle with, Wes may not struggle with. Uh, what Mike Hensley might struggle with and need to rise up higher in. Uh, somebody, Steve over here, may not have any struggle in that area at all. So you have to determine what are the areas you need to be stretching yourself forward in. And listen, don't expect it to be comfortable. If it's too comfortable, it's not going to do you any good. Just like we talked about last week, if you go to the gym, you know, if you go to the gym and you never put any weight on those machines and all you're doing is, is lifting up the, the, the mechanism that the weight's supposed to be on and, it's, and you're not putting any weight on it that's uncomfortable, how many know you're not getting anywhere? And it doesn't take a genius to figure that out. It's the same thing 
with the other areas of our life that we need to stretch ourselves in. So, put some pressure on. Look at your neighbor beside you. Say, put the pressure on. Amen. Put some pressure on that thing. Put some weight on. And uh, you'll be able to do more than you think you can do. All right. Tonight, I had a whole different direction for tonight. And uh, I got up this morning. Normally, my notes are already prepared, but I just... I had not prepared the final draft this morning. I was up uh, a little bit after five. And the Lord just kept talking to me about what I'm speaking to you about tonight, and that is the benefit of resets. And um, I know we just did a whole year at Grace Fellowship, and we emphasized a reset. But I sense the Lord wanted me to share with you tonight, uh, specifically in the arena of being a man. Uh, there are going to be times as men, we need resets in our life. And uh, a lot of times when you mention a reset, because a reset has to do with starting again, or I put the definition there to set back to an original position. Uh, a lot of times when we think of a reset, we think of that in a negative sense. So if I were to say, I need a reset, it's an admission that I'm not where I need to be. Or it's an admission that uh, I've allowed some things to veer off track or get off course. And it's almost like I can't admit that I need a reset. Now, how many of you know men really struggle with admitting that they're wrong? Am I in the right room? Or we really struggle, maybe we'll say it a little nicer. We struggle with saying I wasn't right. That's a little nicer way to say it, all right? So, uh, I mean, I hate it when my wife is right and I'm wrong. And then i got to convince her that I was right. <laughs> Y'all do the same thing. But we struggle with saying, I need to do something or I need something. I need more. It's interesting, you know, the women, they have about, they'll have about 70 downstairs tonight if they're hitting the same numbers they've had the first two weeks. And uh, the women are always... Uh, they, they always run to Pastor Patty or to other leaders in the church with the need for counseling or encouragement or some word that the pastor might have for them. And so Pastor Patty spends all this time with the women. And I mean, it's amazing. It's just every day. And it could be all day, all right, online, answering questions, dealing with people, even people that don't attend this church. Men don't do that. You know, I will get a note ever now and then from a, a man and say, Pastor, what do you think about this? Or would you please pray for me? I'm going through this. We just struggle in admitting that we really need some help every now and then. And it's the same thing when we talk about resets. It's almost a struggle for us to say, I need to reset some areas of my life because we feel like in doing so, it's an indictment against us. Now, I need to give you some clarity on that. Whenever we say before the Lord or because of what the Lord is doing in us that we need a reset, God sees that as a very positive thing. He does not view that as a negative thing. Whenever you say, I need to rise higher or I need to shape up or make an adjustment in this area of my life or I need some help from a Christian brother or from pastoral leadership or I need a prayer partner, it is never perceived by God as weakness. And listen, it's not weakness, it's really strength. Amen. So one of the greatest strengths that you can, can operate in is the strength of recognizing when you need to reset some areas and then do whatever necessary to reset those areas. So when we talk about resets, we're not talking about that you've fallen off the wagon and, and that you just, you know, you're, you're back to square one. You might be. But when we talk about resets, we're talking about in a very positive way, we need to learn the benefits of this thing called reset. Now, this is huge. Uh, I was, uh, well, I've been saved most all my life. And uh, I've been in ministry, soon be uh, 40 years, just a few years, it'll be 40 years. And... Uh, it's interesting that just over the last few years, the Lord really began to show me how that I needed 
certain resets to occur in my life and that that was a positive thing. And so the reason I'm sharing this tonight is because this, this is a secret to success. And the reason I say it's a secret, nobody wants to talk about it. If you will learn how to make adjustments and to make the resets in a positive way, the things that need to be adjusted in your life, if you will learn how to recognize and do that as the Lord works to do it in your life alongside of you with your cooperation, if you'll learn to do that, you'll get up and rise up from every situation and you'll be able to find the strength to go forward. And the thing that I've seen over the years is so many men, it's not just men, men and women, but we're in a men's class and we'll say to the men, I've watched so many men get beneath the load of daily tasks or beneath the burden of, of family life, business life, their career, their finances, everything falling on their shoulders. And I have watched so many times they would burn out and just, just be crushed beneath that load. How many of you know that's never the will of God? God's will is for us always to be able to rise up. So the, the key to success in this, and, and I'm speaking from my own life, as a pastor, because, you know, listen, if y'all are under this uh, impression that pastors have no problems because they're super spiritual, you've got it all wrong. You've really got it wrong. It's like the Apostle Paul said. He said, I don't just have my own problems to deal with. I got all the problems of all these churches. So I got all of you guys to take care of as your shepherd. <laughs> and you're just a few of them. But um, there's always pressure. There's opportunities for heaviness. There's opportunities to be weighted down. And the key to success in dealing with that is to recognize those seasons when you need a reset and identify the areas of those reset and then know how to put it into play. And that's what we're talking about in this session tonight. So I, I put an illustration there in the notes. It's like a broken bone must be reset if it's going to heal properly. How many of you know if you broke your arm and you don't get it reset, then it's never going to work properly? You know, if you break your leg and you don't go through the process of letting that doctor, it may, might even require surgery. If they don't reset that bone and get it set right back in alignment, you might walk but you will not walk straight or you will not walk like you could walk if you had allowed the reset there. Well, it's the same thing with our life. We need to make sure we allow the seasons of resets. Now, get this right now and then we'll move on in this. Every single one of you is going to have seasons when you need resets. Every single one of you. Some of you in some seasons right now where you need some resets. And if you can identify it, it'll help you to be able to rise up and move forward. Some other words that we could use here uh, that would go along with this, reactivate, readjust, rearrange, reorganize, or realign. Now, I really like that word realign. A lot of times, a reset is just getting things realigned in proper order. How many of you know everything has a proper working order? Uh, I think I put the note there, I did. Wheel alignment issues, you know, uh, I don't know how, you know, my car now that, that I have, and maybe just newer cars, we don't have to do as much to them as we did in years past. Is that the way yours are? I don't know, some of you guys are too young to know, but some of you have been around for a little bit longer. Man, you used to have to keep everything up in a, in a greater way. And so uh, wheel alignment, if you don't align the front end at all, you know, if your wheels are out of alignment on that car, how many of you know it's going to wear your tires out? It's going to create pressure where pressure doesn't need to be created. And if it's really, really bad, it can, it can even cause an accident or cause your car to do something it's not supposed to do. If you don't get it back into alignment, greater problems down the road. Is that right? I'm not a mechanic, but I got enough sense to know if I don't get it aligned, if my steering is pulling me to the right or the left and I don't get it aligned somewhere down the road, this is what I know. It's going to cause problems. The other thing I know is it's going to cost me. Well, it's the same thing with the areas of your life. If you do not reset and realign those areas that need to be reset and realigned, 
they're going to cause you problems. And listen, they can cost you greatly. So we want to pay attention to those areas. So let's talk real quickly some potential areas that need uh, ex to experience reset. And first and foremost should be our spiritual life. I'd love to testify to you tonight and tell you that since the day I got saved in 1974 that my spiritual life was just on it and has been on it every day since. I'd love to tell you that, but it would not be true. Now, I will say this. I never got out of church uh, by the grace of God, and uh, I never went through the process of what some people refer to as backsliding. But I can tell you the Christian journey has some mountaintops and it has some valleys. We all agree with that. So there, there have been seasons where spiritually I was high. There's been a lot of seasons where I wasn't high, but I was maybe mid-level, you know, maybe halfway up the mountain. And there's been some where my spiritual life was just in a low state. Even as a minister, you know, there's no secrets around here. When I became pastor at Grace Fellowship, um, by the, within a very short time, uh, by the year 2003, I was battling major depression. And uh, so listen, I wasn't at my highest point. I wasn't experiencing a summit or a mountaintop experience when I was in the valley of depression. All right. So... Uh, we all have those different points, different times. But spiritually, you need to check and see if there's areas that need to be reset. First and foremost, our prayer life. How many of you know it's God's will for us to have a prayer life? Now, I did a lesson. I don't know. It's been probably four or five weeks ago, before Christmas, I think. And uh, I don't even remember what sermon I was dealing with the subject in, but I talked about prayer and I said, the reason a lot of people don't pray is they've got the wrong idea about it. They have made it burdensome. They've really made a bondage out of it. And so if you're having to set the clock in a way to say, I'm going to pray for a certain amount of time, if you're a clock-watching prayer warrior, we got a problem going on. All right? So you might pray an hour. You might not pray an hour. The main thing is you need to pray. Look at somebody right now and say you need to pray. Now, now listen, I used to do my praying. I've done my praying a lot of different ways, but I'll just be honest with you. Most of my prayer life was not an on-your-knee at the altar prayer life. Now, there are times you do that. You know, I, I know, he doesn't mind me saying, but Mike Hensley comes into this church very often and prays. Now, I don't know if he gets down at the altar and prays or if he just walks around and prays, but... A lot of my prayer time was walking around praying. Uh, a lot of times I'd be praying in the mountains, walking and praying in the mountains of southeastern Kentucky. A lot of times praying when I'm in my car. Uh, driving, drive time's a good time to talk to God. And listen, it pays to talk to God when you're driving. Because <laughs> if you're talking to Him, He sees things you don't see coming. And He can help you out, right? He can give you some wisdom, some insight. But... Uh, our prayer life we, it is just that. We need to make sure we have a prayer life. You need to be talking to God about your, your uh, life, meaning your family life, your finances, especially top of the list, your spiritual life, what He wants you to be doing. Uh, if you're married, you need to be talking to God about things relating to your marriage. Anything going on in your life, isn't it wonderful? You can talk to God about anything. And you know the great thing about it, it is He really does know it all you know some people you talk to they act like they know it all some think they know it all but God really knows it all so if you need a solution or you need an answer or you need strength or you need his wisdom in something he's got it so we need to practice talking to him uh, Luke 18 verse 1 this is what Jesus said he spoke a parable to them that men ought to always or ought to pray always ought to pray and not lose heart. The traditional King James Version says, men ought to always pray and not faint, I think. So it's not God's will for you to faint. Fainting is losing heart. It's, it's a step right before giving up or throwing in the towel. And if you're going to survive the pressures, and there will be pressures, then 
Prayer is a remedy, according to Jesus, to keep you from fainting. So if you don't want a, a, a loss from fainting or giving up or quitting, then uh, make sure you give some time to prayer. Matthew 26, 41. Jesus said, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now that verse is very pertinent to, it has a context, but really there's a spiritual law there, I think, and that is the person who watches and prays, they will not fall into temptation. In other words, watching and prayer will be a remedy to temptation. It is a guarding against temptation. And temptation doesn't have to be, you know, the most evil thing in the world. Uh, temptation can be a lot of things that we consider, you know, just little details of life. But watching and praying, diligent prayer is a remedy for that. And then in Luke 5, 16, it says Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness to pray. If Jesus needed to pray, how much more do you and I need to pray? Amen. Amen. So uh, prayer, you might need to reset your prayer life. What about your word time? Does it ever slip away from you? Well, surely not at Grace Fellowship. <laughs> I mean, every series we do, every message we preach, just about everything we teach in this church, they're always, it'll always come around to this. Got to get in the Word, right? Get in the Word. Listen, I never had a pastor that challenged me to get in the Word like I challenged you guys to get in the Word. But I've discovered the key to your success is in the Word. The key to the success of everything in life, it's in the Word. Your healing's in the Word. Your blessing, it's in the Word. Your strength is in the Word. And so the devil will work to steal that word time. Now again, a lot of people have made bondage out of this. Like, well, if I'm not reading 16 chapters a day, then I'm, I'm just not doing any good. And so then it gets too tough and they just throw in the towel with it. Listen, you probably don't read on the level I read on. But you don't have to do what I have to do. Is that right? Aren't, I'm not going to ask how many glad you don't have to do what I have to do. But I have to feed you, so because I feed you, my reading and study of the Word goes, it's a different level. But just because I read and study to feed you, does not, that does not replace my personal feeding time. So even if I was not feeding you or anybody the Word as a minister or a teacher, preacher, then I would still need the word to feed on in my life so I could be successful at being a man of God. Y'all awake? All right. So uh, Jesus said it like this in Matthew 4, 4. This is when he was tempted by the devil and the devil tried to get him to turn the stones into bread. It says, He answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Man lives by the word that proceeds from the mouth of God. There's life in his word. Now, when you discover this, you won't have to force yourself to feed on the word. When you really discover the life of the word, uh, you'll make time for it. Now, I, this is something has to be developed in. Uh, because if you look at the, there's another verse, let's see. I've got it down in these notes somewhere here. Uh, Mark 4, 19, it's on the bottom of the very next page, I guess. I'm using this for something else, but this verse applies. It says, the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. So the word is fruitful in our life, and, and if I'm not giving place to that word or I'm allowing other things to come in and choke it out, there's an unfruitfulness in my life. There's some things not being produced. Now, um, what was I going to say to that? Uh, we need to make sure, we need to be certain that we're having some level of feeding on the word because the devil will come with the cares of this world and with other things, and get your attention drawn off the thing uh, of the word to steal that word. Because if he can take the word from you, he's stealing life from you. So you need some means of the word entering your spirit really daily. 
I got one little tiny amen. I said, daily. Amen. Daily. And uh, listen, we're in the generation that is blessed beyond measure. Amen. I mean, we are blessed beyond measure. You just got to figure out what works for you. Because now we've got the word electronically on our phone. So you could read a passage every now and then, meditate on it. Man, it's simple. You don't even have to carry a Bible with you. You've got it on your, on your device. Uh, podcasting. Uh, we do podcasting here. We've not started this year's podcast, but, but even still, all of our Wednesday night services, Sundays, our own podcast platform. How many of you do listen to podcasts? Quite a few. All right, praise the Lord. Excellent tool. To, to listen to ministry of the Word or the Word. It's a tremendous tool to listen to sermons, and everything that we've done over the last year is in podcast plat platform. If you don't use that and you want to view, well, how many are familiar with YouTube? All right, so we got it on YouTube. And uh, so it's there. Uh, we've got a church app. How many know what an app is? <laughs> All right. So you can get it on, on your smart device, and all the sermons are out there. And then what else we got, Steve? We got Facebook archives. Roku, Roku TV. If you, don't, if you use Roku TV, we've got a Grace Fellowship Roku channel. So, I mean, I don't know what more we can do to put it out there, but what I want you to understand is feeding has never been easier than it is today. It has never been easier than it is today. Now, I will... Uh, even in the short times, uh, driving distance, if you, if you drive on your job, you've got a tremendous opportunity. Um, you told me that you were driving three hours. <laughs> you, gotta, you ought to be a walking Bible, all right? <laughs> Praise the Lord. You ought to have all my sermons, all right? But even if it's a short distance, that drive time, what do you do in that drive time? Listen to country music? Well, I mean, that's all right, but, you know, sometimes that stuff will weigh you, weigh you down, right? Yeah. And uh, some of the so-called Christian music is doubt, fear, and unbelief, too. Yeah. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Now, my wife, is music is, is one of the top things in her ministry. So when I'm in the car with her, we hear music, and we hear it loud. And I, I, I've, I said to her that, I said, does your device work on anything but the loudest level? You know, and, but listen, I occasionally listen, occasionally to music. But most of the time I have the word going when I'm, a, at least when I'm going to Lexington or somewhere on a hospital call, it's an awesome opportunity. And I'll, if I, when I was on the state council for the Church of God and I had to be up there a little more often, uh, I'd have, I, I'm looking at it like this. I got an hour and 15 minutes of drive time from the time I leave my house till I get to the state office, and, and then another hour and 15 minutes from the time I leave the state office to get home. So that means I've got two hours and a half of feeding time. That's the way I looked at it. Now, I'm not saying you got to do what I do, but if you'll look in your life, you can find some time for the Word. And the Word is your life source. I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, you may have an emotional experience at the altar, a spiritually emotional experience at the altar on Sunday, but that will not replace the feeding on the Word of God. In your, it won't replace that. And uh, if we lay hands on you and anoint you with oil or whatever we do on Sunday, that's wonderful, but it will not replace your personal feeding time. So one of the areas that we need to reset, I mentioned two here. We need to reset in prayer. We probably need to reset in the Word. But you just, you're the only one that knows that. When the Lord says reset in the Word, then get in the Word. In one of these ways, get in the Word. Amen. Praise the Lord. Pat? I just really think it's so important to realize that if we're not in the Word, then whatever we're doing in prayer is not going to be sustained. That's exactly right. Because there's no life in it if you're not in the Word and, and praying the Word. Let's so, talk about that for just a moment because I, I want to make sure we get what the Holy Spirit wants to say to us 
in this session tonight. Uh, my prayer life, as a Christian, I always had a prayer life of some type. But my prayer life took on a whole different level of fruitfulness or productivity when I included the Word in my prayer time. And what we mean by that, that may be, some of you may be, you know, if prayer has been more of a traditional thing for you, when you pray, you can literally take the promises of the Word before the Lord in prayer. You know, there's some scriptures to that. The Lord said, put me in remembrance of my Word. Uh, then uh, we know that the Word is our covenant. And so one of the greatest things you can do is pray those promises. Find the promise for what it is, something you need, and then pray those promises. And let me, let me add to that. Prayer is communication with God. But out of prayer also comes that release of authority. And that's where you don't, you're not begging God, bombarding heaven to do what God said he would already do. But in putting him in remembrance, what you're actually doing, you are participating in drawing upon the covenant blessing that has come through that promise. Does that make sense? So when the Lord said, I am the Lord that healeth thee, you know, I don't have to beg him to heal me and, th and pray that I will say enough to convince him. He's already convinced or he wouldn't have said, I am the Lord that healeth thee. All right. Uh, so what I'm doing in prayer is using my faith to receive what the Lord has promised to me. That's one part of it. The other part is I'm exercising dominion and authority over the sat satanic powers that want to keep me sick or keep me broke or whatever it is. So it turns your prayer life totally around. A lot of people's prayer life is nothing more or less than trying to beg God to do something. Now I want to throw something else in here. Uh, I heard something the other day, and uh, sometimes I hear things that just makes you want to cringe. You think, did they really say that? And uh, right now is the time of year that a lot of churches are doing their 40-day fast or 21-day fast. Most of them are doing 21-day fast. Some push on to that higher level. Nothing wrong with that whatsoever. All right, we've done that here. However, this was the statement that was made, uh, and it was a promotion. It was an announcement of the fasting and the prayer, uh, the 21 days of prayer that, that a certain place was going to be doing. And the way it was promoted was this, that if we fast for 21 days, we will force the hand of God to move in breakthrough. Now, how many understand what's wrong with that statement? Fasting does not force the hand of God. Fasting conditions the receiver. There's no problem with the transmitter. God's the transmitter, all right? But in this person's, and, and listen, I know the person, totally innocent in it, probably was taught this all of his life, that when you fast, you're forcing God to move. That's not what prayer is. That's not what prayer is. It's not forcing God to move. It is receiving of the Lord. When Daniel prayed about a certain thing, he was 21 days getting the answer. But when the angel showed up, the first, one of the first things the angel said was, the Lord heard you and responded immediately when you prayed. But I was hindered in getting the answer to you because the prince of Persia, the prince of the air, was out there and hindered me. And then uh, I believe, I may not be quite accurate on this, but I believe if you'll study further that that, that, that angel left Daniel to go back and the, the inclination or the, uh, the, uh, the insight there said that he was actually going back to still fight principalities and things that were going on in the heavenly realm. So the answer wasn't held up by God. The answer was held up by spiritual forces that were at work. And that's a lot of the case in things we're praying about. But with all that being said, back to what we were talking about, you may need to have a prayer reset or a word reset in your life. And a reset requires change of habits and routine. So if your routine 
has taken you away from good spiritual disciplines, reset that, and that will mean resetting your habits. Can you say amen to that? Amen. All right, let's real quickly move on to the top of whatever page where it says family. Sometimes you need a reset in regard to family life. Now, somebody said, well, I know God's interested in my spiritual life. Listen, God's interested in every single part of your life. Yeah. Say every part. every part. So that means he's interested in my family, my marriage, my finances, my job. Anything that's going on in my life, God has an interest in it. He wants it to be blessed. Now, here's an interesting verse. 1 Timothy 5, verse 8. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Amen. Now, boy, that's strong, isn't it? But now most of the time, and listen, let me back up. While the context of this is daily provision or finances, I really believe that the message here, you know, Paul speaking to Timothy, would be, that it's our job as the men to see that all things are provided for within our house. Right? Because there's a lot of men that provided financial provision, but they did not provide other provision. Are y'all following what I'm saying? So if I, if, if I can provide everything financially that my kids need, but I can't give them the love, nurture, training, discipline, wisdom that should be coming from a father, then I'm not fully providing for my house. It's getting real quiet in this house. <laughs> but the reason I point that out is, you know, as men, we need to make sure that we're taking care of our families. Nobody has the responsibility for your family like you do. And you know... Sometimes we look to the church. The church will do their part, but they can't do your part. So you have to set things into motion for your family and lead that family. Remember, you're called for dominion and subduing, and you've got to exercise dominion in that family realm because the devil would love to take your family uh, off the rail and get them sidetracked and just take them off into uh, catastrophe. But you can guard against that like nobody else. Say amen. amen. Say you're talking to me, Pastor. <laughs> All right. So, so some things we need to do. Uh, establish family time. This is especially important if your career requires travel or excessive hours. By the way, yeah, I'm going to say this. <laughs> now, we don't have Sunday night church on a regular basis here anymore. But we do have Sunday morning service. We have two of them. We have a 9 a.m. and a 10.30. Family time should not take the place of worship time. And a few years ago, this became a really strong uh, belief with a lot of people. Well, especially when we were at Sunday night. Sunday night's our family time. We had people actually tell, tell us that. Sunday night's our family time. Listen, you need to teach your family the significance of, of corporate worship showing up and being in the house of God. That's going to do more for them than anything else. Now, I can tell you, my dad worked, when I was uh, very small, my dad would work uh, 10, 11, 12 hours a day. And he worked six days a week, uh, Monday through Saturday. He got a half a day off on Thursday. Uh, which meant he went to work on Thursday, but he came home about one, about 12 or 1 o'clock in the afternoon and would spend about three or four hours at home, and then he had to go back and close up the store that he managed. He was a grocery store manager. And so Dad only got Sunday off and a half a day on Thursday. We never missed a Sunday morning service. We never missed a Sunday night service. And I look back, and, and I do not feel cheated. I really do not feel cheated. Uh, my dad w did the best he could with what time he had left. He was there for me and my brother. And on uh, Sunday afternoons, we did things between the two services. Uh, dad fished. I wasn't a fisherman, but I went fishing with my dad different times. Uh, dad hunted. I 
didn't do much hunting, but I went a little bit with him. Now, that was my choice. That wasn't by him. He, he seemed to find time to do things in the little bit of time that he had, and it was absolutely amazing. I look back on it now, and I think I couldn't do what my dad did. I would find it very difficult for me to function with the schedule that my dad functioned with. But I, of all the things that dad could have given to me, I am now, you know, that I'm 57 years old, I am so glad that he brought me to the house of God and taught us to value and honor that service time in the presence of the Lord. That has gone with us far beyond anything else he could have given to me as his child. It's, it's, it still goes with me. It, it just changed my life. All right. So with that being said, make sure you do establish family time, but don't make the family time Sunday morning time. Amen. Work around. Figure out what to do to establish that time with your family. But make sure you have it. Make sure you're having some time with your family. Be certain uh, to do specific things for your spouse. Your marriage will need resets. Y'all figured that out yet? <laughs> Praise the Lord. There are times it needs, it needs adjustments. And sometimes it's easy. As The longer you are married... Sometimes you can get into, as the old southeastern Kentucky saying is, we get in the rut with things. And uh, listen, for men, some of these things, you know, resets may not be as important as to the women. But as the other old saying is, is if mama isn't happy, there ain't nobody happy. Y'all figured that one out. This is a private session. You do know that. <laughs> Until it gets posted. <laughs> So, pay attention to those areas, though, that you might need to work on family-wise and in your marriage. You know, the Lord will bring these things to your attention. He will bring them, them to your attention. Reset the priorities of your family. Too many activities and responsibilities challenge the real priorities of our family. I think sometimes you've got to just determine these are the priorities of our family. You've got to decide where your family is and where your family is going and you've got to be able to recognize when certain priorities are getting shifted so that your, your family is getting derailed and off course into some things that you don't want your family getting into. Now, it might be okay for the family across the street or down the road, but you have to determine, is this where our family's going? And if you've not discovered this yet, if you've, if you've got children and you've not heard this, I don't know where you've been. If you've not got children, you're going to hear this, and that is, well... That's not the way our generation does it. And so that means that I'm outdated and the way that I would lead is no longer pertinent. But how many of you know we have to establish, still establish the direction for our families. And your kids may have a different opinion from time to time. But you have to work to lead them in the right direction. And that begins with understanding what your priorities are for your family. You and your wife need to be on the same page in this. Are y'all here? Because if you're not, you're going to have another calamity. It's just going to be a division and a divided house. You know, uh, it, it, it's not going to stand. So you need to be together and understand this is the priority for our families. Because here's the thing. Once you've got your children into school and uh, they get into different programs, every group out there is working overtime for their attention. And they will, they will take them in the direction they want for your children unless you have your priorities established and declared this. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so you figure that out and figure the balance out in that for your family. God will help you with that. But listen, if you do not have some set priorities, they will get thrown off course. I'll tell you real quickly. And before long, you'll have chaos. And it's much harder to bring things back and reset them back into the right alignment if you've allowed it to be off course for a long period of time. So, so if you see things getting off track, getting off course, work now to bring it back on course and keep it there. Amen. All right. Uh, what else we got? Uh, I know y'all don't want me to talk about it, but we'll talk about it briefly. I think it's our last thing here. That's one of our last things. That's our health. <laughs> you might need a reset in dealing with your health. Is your body important? It's real important because the day it dies, you leave this world. 
Now, that's wonderful. Spiritually, you got promoted. But everything that you can do on this planet ceases the moment you leave this body. And uh, the devil would love to kill you off early. But there are people who need you. And uh, we need to stay around. I said we need to stay around. Listen, my family needs me to hang out. All right? Because there are some things I got better wisdom than they got. Y'all, y'all understand what I'm saying? So, so they need me. I get accused of being like my mother. My mother, before she passed uh, all the years of her life, she was like the head of the whole family, and, and she told them when they needed to do this, when they needed to do that, if they needed to wear a coat, if they needed to, to wear warmer clothes, if they need. In a lot of ways, I'm like her. So uh, we need to hang around because we've got a generation that needs us. All right, I'm speaking to some of the older ones. They need us. Brother Brown, they need us. Praise the Lord. And uh, so we're not checking out early, but we need to pay attention if our health needs a reset. And with that being said, we need to pay attention to diet and exercise. And you don't have to be one of these guys like some of our guys that are at the gym for excessive hours every day. I can tell by looking at you. All right. But maybe you need to do a simple walk or you need to do some simple movement. You need to move. You all right? Are you hearing what I'm saying? So um, I, I don't have a, a gym routine. I have shown up. <laughs> I have a membership, all right? I'm still deciding if, if it's worth it or not. But one thing I do practice every day, unless the weather is just not cooperating, I walk, and this morning, uh, between 7.15 to 7.45, I was on a walk in my neighborhood, and then when I get home and bring Zachary home from school, I walk again, so I get about, right now, maybe 45 minutes to an hour of good walking outdoors, which gives you an added benefit if you are a nature lover. Uh, there's a piece that comes out of that that you will not get at the gym. I mean, I don't, see, I like to walk, but I also like to walk down and look at the creek. <laughs> if you watch any of the little videos I put out, I, I like to go down and look at the creek. I like to look at the trees. I like to look at the birds. I like to look for deer. I, I mean, I just, and, and here, it's amazing at when I'm doing that, a lot of times I guess it distracts my mind from the busyness of life, and why I'll be out walking, looking at a tree, and all of a sudden, a sermon, God will shoot a sermon idea right in the middle, and I'll grab my phone out. I have a file I keep in there at all times. When the Lord gives me a thought, it goes into that file so the devil cannot steal it. All right, but you need to be doing something. Turn around and tell somebody, do something. All right, and you need to give attention to what your body is saying. Um, here's one verse for you, Mark 6, 31. Jesus said to them, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. Now notice he said rest a while, not forever. <laughs> Some people missed it. He said rest a while, for there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. So Jesus said, you guys are ministering to so many, you need a time of rest. That's another word for somebody. You've got to make time for rest. Say amen to that. I don't have time to go through the rest of this. You'll have to look through some of these things yourself. But on that rest issue, um, I was going through some things. And uh, if you were here during the healing school and some of my testimony, I've talked about it. At one battle I had with my blood levels dropping, the Lord had spoken to me a few weeks earlier and told me to rest. Now, that was a different kind of rest than what I'm talking about in these notes. That was resting in faith, all right? To rest in faith means I'm not in warfare mode. It means I'm resting in the assurance of the promises that I have already been meditating in. And that's how that battle was won, just resting in what God had done. But if it hasn't been very long ago, I was in another situation where my mind just seemed to be filled with my mind was going in this direction and that direction and we had these too many irons in the fire too many things do y'all ever have that kind of situation in your life 
And it just seemed like we had too many things. I mean, we had demands on us in every direction. And uh, I was walking and, and just walking, and the Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to rest. I said, I thought, I need to rest like I did when in that faith. No, I want you to rest physically, emotionally. I want you to rest, all right? And so what he was saying to me was, I need to rest here. How many know you can be laying down at night, your body can even sleep, and there be total unrest right here? And if there's unrest here, there will be unrest in your body. And when there's unrest in your body, sickness and disease thrive off of that. All right, so with all that being said, the Lord said, I want you to reset some resting patterns here for a season. I want you to change some things, and I want you to just rest. Now, that's easier said than done, <laughs> but I had to figure out how to calm my mind in some areas, how to keep my mind from being overactive in some things, and physically how to to rest. Now, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm still in that season. Although I'm teaching tonight, I'm preaching, I'm doing all this, I'm in a season where I'm experiencing a little different level of rest right now by the direction of the Lord. What is the Lord doing? He's having me reset some things because if I don't pay attention to that reset and rest, it's going to affect my body. And if it affects my body, it allows for sickness, disease, strength loss. Then guess what? I call in sick. I'm not planning on calling in sick, right? So I better pay attention to reset that area of rest in my life. Now, there's some other things there. You can look through it. Did you get anything out of this tonight? This is very practical information, but I can tell you this. This was not a planned session, and so the Lord must be talking to some people tonight. You need to pay attention to those areas the Lord's been bringing up in your spirit. If he's been waving a flag over some specific areas don't ignore it pay attention and ask him lord what do i need to do to adjust realign and reset in those areas that you're dealing with me about if you ask him he will not deny you the answer he will show you precisely some things now be be ready if he tells you that you need to do some things, and you do not do it. How many of you know it's not on God? I mean, if the Lord tells you, you know, it, 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 we just, I know I've gone over here a minute, but Kenny Hughes just came through, you know, heart surgery. And Kenny went for weeks and even months with his body telling him there's an issue going on. And he ignored it and ignored it and ignored it. And then to the point, finally, he did something. And he had, to, he had major, major issues. Most of you know the story. And, and even uh, coded six times. Is that right, John? Six times. Man, that's, that's just unthinkable. Should he have been listening and paying attention, he'd tell you absolutely, yes, pay attention. Because, listen, now Kenny's my brother-in-law, so I can pick on Kenny. I'll tell Kenny, I said, now, Kenny, if you're going to kill over and I'm going to do your funeral, don't you think I'm going to get up there and tell them that God did this? Because <laughs> your body was trying to tell you that you needed to reset. All right? So pay attention. Turn around and tell somebody, pay attention. All right, stand with us tonight. We could go on. Maybe the Lord will give us another session on some of these things. But these are practical things, yet they'll affect you spiritually. They'll affect your spirit, soul, and body. Uh, Father, thank you for this time together tonight. We give you praise and glory for everything you're doing. We're growing stronger and stronger as men of God. We're going to be stronger people than ever. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Bless you guys. Thank you for coming tonight.